Welcome to this interview, Dr. Roald Hoffman. What is science? And what is science in relation to other ways for humans to deal with the wonders of life, like literature and poetry, or music, or arts, or religion? This is what we are going to talk about today. Maybe we'll start with the, the first question. <laughs> what is science? Well, first, I think science is a social system, a Western European invention, not an American one, uh, for gaining reliable knowledge. I would say not truth, and we can talk about why there is a difference. And it has several components to it. It has curious people, some of whom are interested in mathematics or good at it. It has a people who are willing to get their hands dirty, experimenters, not just philosophers. It has a system for communicating that knowledge and in fact a compulsion, if not an addiction, for doing so, exchanging that knowledge. Uh, and it is a, a system which makes use of pretty normal people to to get interesting things to learn about the world around us and for us. It has another, it has another aspect, and which sometimes has been lost, it was over-romanticized in the 19th century, and that is that it should improve the human condition in some way. And that's implicit in Nobel's will. It's interesting that it's there because it's a 19th century document. I would you say, like Peter Medjewar does, that um, at least we should um, ameliorate the human condition, to make it a little bit better. That is a little bit lost in science, it becomes so professional as it is, but I think it's, it's important to, re to revive it. Mm. You also wrote something else about science in your book, uh, together with a colleague, Old Wine New Flasks. You wrote, the purpose of science is to revive and cultivate a perpetual state of wonder. So, I think science has a spiritual side to it. Yeah. Uh, and that sense of wonder is what I refer to. And that also sometimes in the everyday struggle to gain knowledge is, is lost. But it's, it's part of what keeps people going. And so, knowing what the structure of DNA is, uh, how, how things change and replicate in the body, is, is just so wonderful. So, uh, there is a sense of wonder. In that sense, I think the divisions that somehow science is materialistic, uh, and that there are other things which fulfill us spiritually, whether it is art, music, or, or religion for some, or or, or literature, I think that's a little bit of a false division. I think there is spiritual value in science, uh, which sometimes scientists have lost themselves. Now, it's one way of knowing the world, to get back to your initial question about other ways. Uh, it's not the only way of knowing the world, and one of the things that is not so good about a science is given in its beginnings in an analytical tradition of Descartes uh, of dividing things up and then uh, trying to compose them and then with a, a reductionist uh, philosophy added to it that somehow understanding is defined by going deeper and deeper what you've got is a setup of science that it's, it's created a set of problems for itself which are capable of solutions. Uh, and that's very different from what the arts and literature gives us. And it deals with such a small part of the world. And there are scientists who would say that that other things too, like religion and art, eventually come out from some genetic predispositions and the manipulations of our culture. I'm thinking of uh, Wilson's sociobiology and things like that. But I, I think there are different ways of understanding this world. There is a reductionist way, 
Let's see, if someone sends me a poem, an, an anonymous poem, and it's a line from, uh, from John Donne, uh, Love is a growing or full constant light, and his first moment after noon is night. Ah, oh, knowing the sequence of firing of neurons in John Donne's mind when he wrote that poem, or in a person of the mind, or the person who sent me that poem, or in my mind as I read it, knowing the sequence of beautiful biochemical actions in be behind the firing of the neurons, that'll get you a lot of Nobel Prizes, but it has nothing in the world to do with understanding that poem. That poem is understood on the, language, on the level of the language and the psychology of the moment in terms of questions that seem to some scientists questions that are circular reasoning because you're using the same words to define a question as you're trying to explain them and yet that is where meaning is to be found. So that's, that's I think scientists sometimes get a little bit arrogant mm. and thinking about all they can do with the powers that they have and then they get upset when people outside of science still value religion or art. Ah, I don't think scientists are jealous of art, but attitudes toward religion are a little strange. Mm. Uh, so I think science is not everything. No. Are there any similarities between the scientific way of searching for answers and, for example, religious or for artistic? Well, I think, let's talk about religion and science a little mm -hmm. bit. I okay. think religion and science come out initially from some of the same roots, and that is a desire to understand the world, the mysteries of the world, the lightning, the lights, the stars, to find patterns in it. Now, they, they start out also for many religions with... Um, a feeling that the world is real. Some religions have added on that the real world doesn't matter and what matters is the afterlife. But a lot of religion begins that with the idea that the world is real and that the actions of human beings matter, whether you are good in some way. I think that's actually a fairly uh, a common starting point. After that, I think that there are differences on deciding who is in charge of the order, let's say. Mm. But I think they start out from some, from some similar things. What was the rest of the question? There, there is, the, there is the, uh, anyhow, a difference maybe when you think about religion, you think also about the postulates and religious beliefs that you can't question. Are they so, some dogmas in science that you are just not mentioned? One can look for dogmas in science, yeah. but you know, I th and I think they are there. Uh, they are there. At the same time, the Oedipal complex is very strong in science. So, young people, what I mean is young people uh, make careers by slaying their fathers uh, and by throwing mm -hmm. out ideas, and that is an accepted way of doing so. Uh, much less respect for authority in the end. But there are, there are dogmas. So why are there dogmas? Because there are human beings at work. But somehow the social system of science, that there are many people doing things, assures that in the long run those dogmas don't stay dogmas. Whereas the social system of religion perpetuates the authority often uh, and makes it more difficult to introduce change. Hmm. Interesting balance in between change and, and stasis in, in science. Um, you, you do invoke authority. That's in part what those footnotes are about in papers. Uh, but at the same time, you want to do something new. Interesting system. So we, we are somewhere near the question of the truth. You mentioned that science is not yes. searching for truth. I think it's searching for approximations to the truth. Mm -hmm. But I'll tell you why I don't want uh, us to be put up in a certain 19th century way as searchers for the truth. Uh, first of all, we all know that uh, there are different approaches to the truth, and the truth is ephemeral and can be expressed in different words. Uh, 
even if uh, we all believe there is an underlying reality, and I do believe that. But I think our representations of that reality are human-made. In that sense, I also think that religions are human-made, even mm. though there is something that seeks. Uh, I think religion is an emergent phenomenon, like science, and like humor, and like literature. It's human. Um, I th the reason I don't want us to be searching after truth is we put ourselves up then as, and I will mix the metaphors of religion and science as priests of the truth. And then we have that much further to fall. Why is the public so interested in fraud and science? For the same reasons it's interested in the sexual misdeeds of our ministers. Mm. If you set yourself up ethically at some point, to be about truth or morals, and then you don't obey it, or then people take delight in that somehow, because it confirms to them their own ambivalence and weakness in some way, that they cannot be good all the time. Uh, and so I think, I think fraud in science is not important actually, because of the system of science, and also I think because of the psychopathology of fraud. Uh, let me explain. I think the people who forge data or facts are usually sick in some way. Um, and being sick, there are two consequences. One is that their, uh, their sort of natural defenses against being thinking that they'll be caught when they forge are abrogated. Mm are put aside, so they do crazy things. Second is that they never forge anything dull. They always forge something interesting. Uh, they, some, they, they, for instance, in the, in, even in the most devious cases, there's some student who is sick and there's some professor who has a favorite theory and a student concocts an experiment which supports that theory. Something like this happened at Cornell. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but that is, it's always something interesting. It's not a little everyday cheating of that type. And so, given that scientists, being human, are much more likely to try to prove somebody wrong than to prove somebody right, the moment somebody comes out with something interesting, sure enough, there is somebody around the world who has some vested interest in that problem, an alternative theory who will test that experiment. Yeah. But we are there the, the, about the question of truth. When you mentioned that there is this part of Oedipal complex in science that you have always to throw away the old truths and put the new ones. So it's uh, it's something about the provisoric nature of the truth in science. The truth is provisional. Um, it is uh, to be modified in different ways. Um, I think reliable knowledge is a... That phrase, reliable knowledge, that I like, is not mine. I've borrowed it from John Zyman, who is a British uh, physicist and sociologist of science who's written about this. I sort of like it. Uh, I think we try to get things that are reasonably reproducible and that can be used. And they can be. Um, the, the description for an aspirin factory written in Japanese or in Portuguese is, allows that factory to be built independent of the language mm. that it is written in. Yeah. There is something else there also. That people talk about the relation between the truth, the beauty and the simplicity. Um, yes. Do you think there is such a relation? No, I think this is. I, I think this is a falling of uh, the into the weakness of the human mind to think that the world is simple, and um, and it it's an interesting tripartite relationship. It's exemplified. I guess I'm fighting in part what the what I would say is pernicious ideas of physicists coming into chemistry. Who, think, you know, the moment you can write down Schrodinger's equation that you, all of chemistry is solved. Well, 
And behind that are statements by Dirac, a great physicist, theoretical physicist, about uh, this equation is that the most uh, that an equation, if it's beautiful, must be true. Yeah, it's some ideal world, uh, but not in this world that we have. Uh, the equations are simple in part, they get complex. Symmetry is there, symmetry gets broken. Things happen in the body, especially when they're subject to evolution things, in incredibly complicated ways. Uh, the way a message is sent from one nerve to another with an intermediate of a molecule of dopamine or serotonin, and there is one thing that sets it loose, another one that detects it, and but it's not done in one way. After a while, this thing looks like what we would call in the United States a Rube Goldberg machine, one of those cartoons where there is something that does something else that does something else and terribly complicated. So those things are, I think those are natural, that things are complicated. I think it is the dreams of uh, the simplicity of our mind, which cannot sometimes deal with complexity. And that's true in personal relationships as well as it is with, uh, uh, with um, politics. Uh, or with science. What's interesting to me is that scientists should fall for simplicity, given that they're faced with the realities of complexity all the time. And they'll come back and tell you, the physicists, well, if you take it apart, underneath there are some simple equations. Yes, but the taking apart has destroyed the essence and the reality of anything that is real. And they never put it together. They only take the watch apart, like children. Mm. So this is reductionism? Yes. Mm. Is this the voice of a chemist? Yes. It's the <laughs> voice of a chemist and the voice of someone trying to fight uh, reductionism, exemplified by what Steven Weinberg writes about, or other people like that. And it's in defense of the complexity that, that is the reality of the real world. I think it's also perhaps uh, a poet uh, talking here who, who uh, wants to see the particular and sometimes doesn't want things taken apart, both the particular and the relationship of the whole to each other. There are sciences that look at that, but uh, not the ideology of science, the philosophy of science, because the philosophers who did this, with one exception of Michael Polanyi, were physicists in that training, or the training was in logic and philosophy, tend to go for the simplest point of view. So, as you mentioned, this is also a voice of a poet, not only a chemist. So yeah. Maybe we can listen to one of your poems. Sure. Um, let me read a poem, but let me preface it by some comments about it. It's in it you'll see many voices of different ways of trying to understand the world around something simple, which is something happening in in Provence, in France, where I see an olive tree. And the poem is called Enough Already. And behind it, initially, it was called Dayeno, mm -hmm. <laughs> which is what one, uh, a, a, a prayer, a, a song in a Passover Seder, uh, which it says, means that would have been enough. If God had only taken us out of Israel, that would have been enough but he had done other things. And there, there's a little bit of that. And or she. Or she, yes. And uh, there is in this also, so there's something of, about my Jewish background in this, if, if, if in the phraseology here. Let me read it anyway. Enough already. You walk into the sun-splashed olives, mossy trunks, greener than fresh grass. 
This doesn't seem to be enough. So you think, even here they grow olives only on warm terraces, and ask who first found that olives had to be cured. This cleverness too does not satisfy. So walking hand in hand into the grove you say, the world needs us and other lovers to give such life which would do nicely for most, save those who'd leave it for a creator. But then, alone, you look real close, and the black spot on the green bark you reach for sharpens into inch and a half of scorpion, and you see a red beetle, and by God, that does suffice. Thank you. So, it's just, um, yeah, there isn't too much science in that poem. No. Do you, do you find science as inspiration in writing? Yes, it is. Um, it is limited because some of the sort of poetry and science is dependent on being part of the cognitive framework uh, of knowing what went before, what it's about. But part of it is that what I find inspiring is the, the language. Uh, kind of natural language that scientists speak. And they don't think the language is important. They think equations and chemical formulas are important. But the language is all we've got, and this language is made to serve and to express things. So words like energy and force mean special things well defined. And you try to make them fit. And then there are words invented and words used. Let me give you an example. Mm -hmm. uh, what often happens to me is, uh, it's given to me to go to dull seminars. And uh, sometime after I fall asleep, uh, I wake up and it's still going on. And so I, I listen sometimes to the words, even if they're not so interesting. And then someone came at a seminar and was talking about some mathematical equation. He said, let us assume free boundary conditions. He was talking about some technical words. Boundary conditions are what you do on a, a mathematical equation to make it fit at the ends. But sort of the idea of free boundaries was very interesting because it was a, a typical Zen idea of yeah. something being free and something being constrained. So I worked that into a poem. So the language is interesting. Yeah. Then there's a lot of metaphor. Uh, there. Uh, let me give you an example. In science and in poetry. Yes, in science, which I can use yeah. in poetry. Someone was talking about, once at another seminar, about the, the metamict state. It's a funny word, metamict. It's not used mm -hmm. very much. Someone had invented it. So what was it? It was a state of matter of, uh, for instance, radioactive minerals. Minerals in which there was a radioactive atom, like thorium. The minerals, when formed, were gave beautiful, transparent crystals, perfect crystals. But after a while, the atoms which were sitting at the sites in the crystal began decomposing in nuclear reactions. And as they emitted some ray, they rebounded and the ions that were left behind bounced into other atoms and created this order in the lattice. And with time, the crystal grew whitish, yellow, amorphous, dull-looking, and was destroyed. And that was the metamic state. It's a poem by itself. I mean, the enemy is within there. Mm. And all that order is being destroyed mm. without any, any plan to do so. So I, I took that and I wrote a poem about that. <laughs> so there's a metaphor like that. Yeah. So I wonder, what, what gives you... It? Maybe I could answer that, but, but what gives you uh, not satisfaction? It's still all of the things. I should let go of some of them. On mm -hmm. all means, the science and the teaching and uh, the writing. Mm -hmm. They all give tremendous satisfaction. I'm not very good at anything else like music, so it is the writing that through which I exercise my my literary artistic um, activities. 
they're all tied together somehow because what gives me the greatest pleasure in the research is finding an explanation which to me is teaching um, or seeing some relationship between two things like that there is a, a group of atoms in inorganic chemistry that behaves in a similar way to organic chemists to an organic grouping that a manganese with five carbon monoxides attached to it is like a methyl group like a CH3 now I see that as both poetry and teaching because uh, and I because I've made a connection between organic and inorganic in some way I have created a metaphor mm. this is like that and that is a little bit like like a poem I also use that for teaching I I give it out to the community I publish it and I talk about it I also still gives me satisfaction even to teach first year chemistry which this last year I this the, the year that uh, 2003 2004 I taught two first year courses usually I teach one first year as I'm doing this year you know I've taught that material for 40 years I know it pretty well but first of all I find some new ways to say it <laughs> Unfortunately, it stretches too long now. Second, there is a light in kids' eyes. Not everyone. For some of them, they're asleep, and for some of them, are too driven by professional aims, society and their parents and themselves. It's not playing just the society to become doctors or engineers, and they don't think enough. But some of them just relax, and, and, and I see, I know, because I'm a good teacher, the nonverbal science that they've understood. And I've released something in their minds. I haven't, the facts that I've told them are irrelevant. I've empowered them to think. That's a wonderful feeling. It sounds like the key to the creativity that you are talking about is that you all the time go back to the stop point somehow, to the first great students, to the first questions. Is it? It has been important to me. I've, I've been lucky that I'm doing theory, so theory is about explaining and understanding phenomenon. Therefore, I'm already in a quasi-teaching mode. Then, I also have found that I'm good at explaining to experimental chemists complicated theoretical things. Uh, one thing I've done since the Nobel Prize, uh, which I've, has been important to me, is I've, it's a simple teaching thing within research, that is, I've explained to a community of chemists called inorganic and solid state chemists how not to be afraid of the language of physics, uh, the language of band structures and densities of states and Fermi levels, the kind of thing that's involved in designing new superconductors. And I wrote a book about it, but I also have been writing many articles, I actually mostly write articles. And by little examples, I've been able to teach chemists not to be afraid of this language. Well, I've done some good things along the way too, but I think it's that, it's that teaching thing which has given me pleasure. You have done a lot of interesting research and written poems and written essays and also a play. Yeah. And you even are one behind the scientific cafe in Greenwich Village in the New York yes. City. And you have also been participating in a carnival, last year's carnival <laughs> in the Rio de Janeiro. I helped a little. Yes. <laughs> I actually went down to car to Carnival for Science. It's hard to believe. But yeah. <laughs> yeah. I it happened. <laughs> it so, so my question would be, how, how do your colleagues or uh, the scientific community react to that? Well, I think, uh, or how do they react to the poetry in general, to the excursions out of the normal mm -hmm. science? On one hand, they're, they react positively, and they're glad someone is doing it. They have a lot of respect for it spiritual things, it shows up in interesting ways, not necessarily directly, but it shows up in little things like when somebody writes a book that they use a poem as an epigraph or something like that. I think 
some of them think that he can afford to do it and we can't. And, and to some extent they are right. The young assistant professor up for promotion, should he or she put um, up front their activity outside of science? I think they, sh they should put in something about their teaching and, and their attempt to communicate to the public, but very often they're afraid to do so and they make some judgment and it's correct that that's not the prime thing they are evaluated on, but it certainly adds a little on the edges and adds some color. It could make a difference in a decision. Some people are just, um, some of my colleagues might think that this is um, something one does when one no longer does science, goes into administration, does history, sociology of science. Well, so to them, I have to prove that I still do science. I just finished writing two proposals. Yeah, I have, maybe I feel I have to prove, um, but I, I enjoy doing it also. You know what hurts the most is when it comes through that somehow people think that this activity of uh, writing poetry or running this cafe or something, when they think this is easy, that hurts. Huh? Because on a poem I go through typically 15, 20 drafts. I don't do that on a scientific now it's true, I've written 500 scientific papers, so it's become easier. But still, it is, it was always easier to do the science. And I'm actually trying something harder. Hmm. And um, they just have to try it, I would say. So I get angry at that, if that happens. But by and large, there is a lot of respect in the community for this. But the, does poetry writing, does, does this make you a better scientist, do you think? I think the poetry writing, of course, makes me feel better about myself for having tried to do that. And I think that's true for about anyone, that they need some other thing to do. I think it has given, the poetry writing has given me a a bit of an appreciation a more for the power of concise statement. and But then I had that in science too. When it again comes back, maybe it's simplicity, but it, it's not quite simplicity because it's a, it's a complex statement of word, but it's, it says something economically, something intensely. And I've learned a little how to do that. Uh, through the poetry. I think much more than either the science helping me to do poetry or the poetry helping the science, I think I am working out something that is in me that wants to see relationships, to watch, to see relationships, to communicate them to people. And I'm doing that in the science, and I'm doing that in the poetry in other ways. And occasionally, because I don't believe in separating my worlds, I will separate them. I'll not write that article in the poetry because I'm not going to get it published, because I've got to get by the gatekeepers. But occasionally, and the kind of thing I've done here in Stockholm, this visit, uh, someone gives me a chance to to talk about both worlds and not to separate them, and I, I love it. Mm. So my final question would be, how do you find time to do all this? Oh, that is not a good question, uh, because it's, it's... I'll answer it honestly, but uh, it... Uh, there is no time to do all this. First of all, I should probably give up the science and do the writing. So why should I? Uh, if I had some rational reasoning behind it, but I'm not rational. Uh, the rational reasoning is that there are simply lots of good people doing science. 
there are fewer people, and therefore I think it's of more value to the society, to be able to work on this area in between of popularizing science, of building bridges between the sciences, and especially the shapers of the spirit in the arts and humanities. Uh, there are less people doing that. But I still find the science fun, first of all. Um, but now, how do I do all this? So I haven't given up the science and the teaching. I'm 67, and I could retire, but I don't want to, I don't have to. So I'm still doing the science. As I said, I just wrote two major research proposals to the National Science Foundation for two different aspects of my work, each for three years of research. I have ideas, I want to work them out. So I've added on the writing to the science. And I would say that if I were to analyze, my days are very complex and interesting, uh, but if I were to analyze it, more than half the time is spent probably on writing or societal activity somehow related to it more than on the science. I've added it on and it has n not been done without personal problems in my life. It's not easy to live with someone like me or who does all these things uh, because I need to be in control of my time. I need to be able to, if I want to, to sit down and write. And uh, there have been stresses in my personal life as a result. So it has not been without, without some difficulties. This is the press. Yes. Mm. I wish we had much more time to talk. But yes. now I, I'm afraid we have to <laughs> conclude the okay. interview. Thank you so much, Professor Hoffman. Yes.